My father was a lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force. He had a long and successful and inspirational career, and I grew up with many stories and lessons from that part of my father's life. He was also a lifelong lover of American history, politics, and the history of law. As a result, I also heard a stream of his thoughts on the nature of those things. If I could isolate everything I heard down to one phrase, though, it would be one of my father's kernels of wisdom that goes, "There is no good rule without exceptions." I think that my father taught me this because I was a troublemaker as a kid. I was very passionate about ethics and quick to anger whenever issues of right and wrong, fair and unfair, were brought up to the forefront. I think my father started saying the phrase. For me to curb that natural tendency to want to impose what I saw as virtues on others by making me realize that there is plenty of information, perspectives, and dynamics that I didn't have yet, it made me realize that any rule I came up with by myself would be insufficient, and as a result, drove me to the philosophical life. After his retirement, my father went to fulfill one of his lifelong goals: to graduate from law school, pass the bar, and become a lawyer. He succeeded in this, and I formed a very romantic ideal of what law school was. I was admitted to Pepperdine Law School for fall of 2016. There is no good rule without exceptions. Became the creed I lived by during this time. The absolutely amazing faculty there made me not only learn the rules and structures of the United States legal system, but all the nuances and processes of law as a living system. They also showed me that I had, without realizing it, long left my romantic ideas of law for my already realized love of philosophy. I still have yet to watch a full episode of Law and Order. So I can at least say I never overly romanticized the realities of law school or working in law. I completed my first semester, but withdrew without taking a final grade in order to plan my path forward into philosophy. My personal history aside, the purpose of this chapter is to discuss rules themselves, what they are, and how they operate. I specifically mean to say rule as opposed to law. Because some tend to connotate the idea of law as being very pure, unchanging, or divine, I'm not speaking of this sort of law, but of rules. A rule is basically when a group of people come together and agree that a certain proposition is going to be treated as the case in fact. A rule is, by its nature, fluid and changing, with the immediate needs of the rule bringers. Imagine children on the playground and how frequently they think up their own games to play. It is utter chaos. The rules change moment to moment. There are no clear goals, and the children experience a frantically increased feeling of fun. Up until the moment a child proposes a change to a rule that most of the children are fine with, but at least one is not. The result is fighting, crying, and the kind of bad screaming that we don't enjoy hearing on a playground. And the solution is for the teacher to come over, soothe the hurt emotions, and to figure out a way to help the children to continue playing together, usually in the form of changing the rules so that the kids can play once more. Rules can change like this because there is an inherent recognition. That the rule doesn't account for all possible significant states of being. They may be useful or pragmatic for a time, but as soon as other significant factors come into play, the rule must change. This change is most often quick and painless because the new significant factors are apparent. As the group that operates with the rule grows in number, however. The obviousness decreases because the rule bringers' access to information becomes more distant. These possible significant factors are not within the scope of the original rule, demand their own consideration, and are thus exceptions. Since no rule can encompass all possible significant states, and because rules are meant to be agreements that account for possible significant states, there must be at least two rules. Each of these rules must have their exceptions accounted for by the other. The rules themselves may exist as single entities or as sets. 
there may be more than two singles or sets of rules. Regardless, for the rules to be truly holistic, the other rules exceptions must be accounted for. For circumstance A, apply rules A, but for circumstance B, apply rules B. When thought of in this way, the barest need for consubstantialism makes itself known. When at least two rules appear to tackle the same subject matter, most often one is not a simple negation of the other rule set. Rather, they will be addressing largely the same issues with different exceptions. It is a different set of posits to explain or dictate the same circumstances. It would be inaccurate to say that existentialism equals not essentialism, or that essentialism equals not existentialism. The negation of existentialism is not existentialism. The negation of essentialism is not essentialism. While existentialism does not equal essentialism, it need not be the case that the two are at odds, except in those cases that we formulate our version of the two to include that pure negation. With the method of consubstantialism, it is important to remove the erroneous negation of the other. In doing so, we enable ourselves the ability to not fall into the tendency of the skeptical mindset to slip into an infinite negation mindset. A negator is not a skeptic. A negator is the self-righteousness inherent in not wanting to do the work of the skeptic. A skeptic is someone who hears the posit of another, then sets out through questioning and forming arguments for or against to answer the question, is that true? The negator responds to every posit with phrases like perhaps or not necessarily or I don't have to believe that, but provides no argument themselves and frequently tries to convince the positor to give the argument for the negation themselves. Just as the sophist wears the mask of a philosopher but only cares for convincing others through skills of rhetoric, the negator wears the mask of a skeptic but only cares to make themselves appear intelligent and greater than a partner in dialogue through the skills of the skeptic. A skeptic whose only skill is negation is not a very good skeptic. The consubstantialist mindset is a challenge to skeptics to use their full skill set to create something new while fully submerged in the cacophony of erroneous negation. In the modern age, a complete philosophical system is simply not possible with the abundance of specified information that we have. Any attempt to draw further conclusions about one field of philosophy from another, when all we had to start was a limited field in one area of philosophy, will necessarily make us ignore other aspects that are significant factors. However, if we look at various philosophical ideas, various empirical disciplines and the information that we gain from them, as establishing separate rule sets that do not necessarily negate each other, but can actually be used in concert, we can then begin the process of actually attempting to create philosophical systems that work in conjunction with other systems without the need to seek preference or priority over those systems. We can create philosophical systems that are specifically designed to account for the exceptions every rule set necessarily will end up having through having two or more substantial systems account for the exceptions of the other. It may not afford you a worldview that is as elegant, as simple, or claiming to have all the answers as other rule sets might lead you to believe, but it is the only practical way I see that we can have as a growing society and a growing species where information far outpaces any given idea. Thank you, my friends. If you enjoyed this video as I slowly build upon this system that I call consubstantialism, by all means, share it with your friends, like the video. If you're not yet, subscribe to the channel. I have new videos coming out every week about the philosophical influences on games and anime. We are still a small community, so the only way that we can grow is with your help. I hope you will join us next week, and remember, 
stay true.